Welcome everyone, very nice to see so many of you here and I hope there are some more watching from the distance. In case there are any watching from the distance who are externals, I thought I will do a little bit of the spiel even though Larry probably needs very little introduction to this crowd here. But our Deputy Head of Composition teaches across composition academic studies, very active composer, researcher and supervisor, so has more hours in the day than most of us. Um, <laughs> His music has been performed nationally and internationally uh, by national and international ensembles such as the BBC Philharmonic, the London Symphony Orchestra, the Halle, the National Ensemble and many international groups. And his music has resounded around the globe, I hope that's not an overstatement, via the BBC radio and various international broadcasters. Um, and what I'm very pleased to, to um, have found out about as well is that all his teaching is not only happening in this building but reaches um, students much further afield. This summer you're going to Dartington, am I right in that? And um, he has taught at Britain Piers as well. So lots of uh, places where he reaches international audiences. Um, we are particularly delighted to have him here with us today because recently, as the internals all know, Larry has started a whole new project which he has recently euphemistically named Saturday Music Fun with Lenny. Um, and I say euphemistically because we probably all know that it's not Saturday music fun, but every day and every night fun <laughs> with Lenny at the moment. Um, and while we know that he has an extremely capable co-director in that particular project, I gather that he also has two very um, stubborn or strong-minded co-managers on the team. So we are really delighted that you're here today and that you are ready to talk to us about pro-rotations, collaboration, communication and interaction. Very welcome. Well, welcome to you. Thank you. Goodness me. That's, um, that's lovely. Um, a few things before I start. This looks like a lot of paper. It's big words. It's not that many, uh, big, as in big print, I should say. Um, so it's not, this is, uh, okay. this is definitely not a uh, paper I'm going to read all the way through. Um, it's, it's two things, I think. Um, one is that I kind of want to put to bed, I kind of want to, um, to say my bit about collaboration. And this slide perhaps slightly sums up how I feel about this at the moment, in certain respects. Um, and I also want to talk about a recent piece that was commissioned by PRISM, just arrived, um, last year. This is a piece that feels very alive for me at the moment. Um, a piece that feels representative of exactly what I hoped it might um, when it was written for me. Um, and these two things do come together, and I might even try and tease out some conclusions and a point from it. Um, but for now, we'll just see how it goes. Hi, Jane. Um, so. Go back to 2001. 2001 for me was the year of the word collaboration. Not that the word hadn't been a recurring feature of numerous wide-ranging conversations about artistic practice and research before then and since. However, in 2021, I found myself helping to oversee a year of modified activity for the Britain Peers Young Artists Program, which in dissolving the usual siloed courses in favour of a single COVID-friendly smaller cohort of singers, pianists, composers and chamber groups, perhaps inevitably kicked off with a wide-ranging discussion about collaboration. This seemed to inform the tone of much of the activity for the year ahead. The year after I found myself running, at very short notice, the brand new Dartington Summer School Advanced Collaborative Composition course, and the name of the course had been chosen by the director become, to distance itself from the historical composition course, which, I, which involved, I am told, a room full of students diligently writing at desks overseen by a professional mentor, potentially reinforcing the rather unfashionable image of, of sort of master and mentee's disciples. I have no interest in the master disciple image or dynamic, but as the opening session descended into a by now very familiar conversation about what collaboration really means, I found myself wishing rather the rather roundabout conversation would just stop so we could actually do something. I've never quite felt on these occasions that I've managed to express myself satisfactorily as to what I mean when I talk about collaboration, so the first part of this paper is my turn to do so. If you share my feelings and rather just do something, the second half of those will I have some sympathies with artists and scholars who are sceptical of the word. In her article, Sharing the Spoils of Shared Practice, the soprano Juliet Fraser articulates these kinds of reservations well, 
and suggests her own definition of a true collaboration, which elsewhere she develops into a more elaborate manifesto. She writes, <clears throat> I'm sorry for our typos, so sleep deprived. We disambiguate immediately. I should say that I think we chronically overuse the term collaboration. A mere coming together of artists is not necessarily collaborative. I would define collaboration as a shared practice that intentionally cultivates an intimate creative space, physical, intellectual, and emotional, to produce a distinctive body of work. I would say the common features of healthy collaboration are a shared aesthetic mission, a non-hierarchical structure, mutual dependence, a dialogue-rich process, and a shared vulnerability. I might go further and stipulate that true collaboration is long-term. After all, these features must be built up over time. The composer John Croft, in a provocation advocating for working alone in a book concerning musical collaboration, considers a, more, a potentially more sinister application of the word. He writes, none of this is to suggest that there is anything inherently wrong with collaboration in the context of musical composition. It's certainly nothing new. But what does seem new is the idea that these practices constitute a kind of alternative paradigm, a challenge to receive ideas deserving the scholarly attention represented by this book, even though they might somehow call into question or render obsolete the solitary activity of the composer. And he goes on to observe that there is now a widespread assumption that the work of one person can invariably be improved upon <clears throat> by involving more people, and that the very idea of an individual creator has somehow had its day. What has changed? It seems implausible to imagine that a workshop version of the writer's spring would have turned out better or to regret that the Eroica wasn't conceived as a collaborative project. But to invoke such examples to him today in defense of solitary work invites the objection that you are enthralled to something called the romantic idea of the genius, an accusation invariably illustrated with reference to Caspar David Friedrich's wonder above the sea of fog. Which I can actually know, so it's kind of fun to find. While again broadly sympathetic, I find myself just as uneasy with these critiques as I do with them itself. While I recognise that Croft takes no issue with collaboration, and I certainly don't object to solitary composition of endeavour, indeed I'm craving a bit more of that at the moment, I don't think apparently pejorative applied terms like workshop and collaborative project are required to recognise that large-scale orchestral works are not the product of an individual, even if the score was made in isolation. The piece was brought to life by a vast orchestra and at the premiere of Full Ballet Company, and it has famously taken many years of performance, discussion and scholarship for a performance practice to establish itself around this transformation of peace. Therefore, while I appreciate Fraser's definition of collaboration, I find this highly aspirational I find this a highly aspirational description, and have found many, if not most, music making scenarios that don't align with this at all, but have nevertheless been mutually transformative and as far as I'm concerned, collaborative. The mere coming together of artists is, in my experience, rarely as meager as that word implies. And my concerns about this go further. In Fraser's rather evocatively titled article, The Voice That Calls the Hand to Write, she writes about the recent fashion for and ubiquity of the word. Firstly, it implies a bracketing together of creative forces, which serves very nicely our current taste for multidisciplinarity and plurality within the arts. Second, it's gender neutral and non hierarchical, and so it suggests that maybe we've moved on from those in terms such as news. Third, maybe its fuzziness and vagueness of the term is useful in promotional terms. It promises a lot, but nobody really holds it to account. More optimistically, though, perhaps its widespread use points to a general shift away from individualism towards social consciousness, lessening the I for the sake of the we. The final, the final point, a lessening the I for the sake of the we, is something I find particularly attractive. Despite my craft, I've never been particularly happy with the reality of Lydia Gurr's work concept for a variety of reasons, and in particular its composer centeredness. I've been very happy to see this erode over the last 50 years or so, and in particular since I've been composing and aware of other composers. Some of these erosions seem to be a direct unravelling of Gurr's conclusions about societal and musical changes at the start of the 1900s. For example, more recently there have been radical shifts of our understanding of musical copyright from the advent of sampling culture in the 70s and 80s, from John Oswald's influential 1986 essay establishing plunder phonics or audio piracy as compositional prerogative, as compositional prerogative, to the perceived cynicism of certain music distribution platforms and the ease that contemporary technology allows one to appropriate and imitate other people's music. 
There have been erosions between classical contemporary concert music and popular music and traditional music from around the world, and this has also impacted on to the perceived norms of making music from scratch and distributing the responsibility for creativity. In 2018, Heloisa Amaral wrote an essay about how performer curators are rethinking roles and formats, acknowledging that in certain areas of new concert music, there's been a shift away from the composer-curator to the performer curator. She begins her article recalling Thomas Schaefer, the director of Darmstadt's summer course on new music, prefaced the 2014 edition, where he writes about a new self-image of the ensembles. It goes on to write that. The new ensemble Schaefer refers to are made up of performers who are keenly aware of their own position within the field of contemporary music. These performers typically create their own projects, test different forms of collaboration, and leave their personal imprint on commissioned works. Further, they think and act beyond their immediate field, searching for new impulses in other musical genres, related art forms, politics, and science, thus questioning the relevance of their work within a larger social context. Finally, they challenge prevailing discourses and modes of musical presentation, particularly in classical concert format. My own interest and aspirations for a view of collaboration, set against the backdrop of, of a shifting view of the central role of the composer, is to reflect more holistically on the wide-ranging and transformational interactions between the individuals involved in making music together. For me, this is intrinsically collaborative, and I'm happy with this being expressed as a broad and fine-tunable analog scale from lighter touched experiences to the kinds of in-depth collaboration collaborative projects Fraser describes. My concern is that Gurr's work concept ends up being superseded by some kind of project concept, which puts new barriers and boundaries in place to what does and does not constitute a meaningful enough set of interactions to be worthy of being badged collaborative. I'd rather reclaim the word as an intrinsic feature of most, almost all music making, and place the responsibility on the musicians involved to consider and tease out the meanings of these interactions. After all, it's not the word or its ubiquity that promises a lot but nobody really holds to account. It's in the dismissive reflections of the full spectrum of musical interactions, all of which are, by degrees, transformative. In this presentation, I offer a recent score and its premiere, Crow Rotations, as an experience I'm more than happy to describe as collaborative, but which sits uncomfortably with some of this recent conversation. That was the first bit. Um, there are two strands of work that particularly inform the composition of Crow Rotations, um, of, of my work, as I should say, lots of other things have informed it. Um, these two strands are connected to a complicated love hate relationship being more involved in the performance of my own works, and recognising how my relationships with the ensembles and individual performers changed for the better when I started to perform my music with them, however remotely or crudely. To the former, I historically suffered with debilitating stage fright, which took until my mid-thirties to satisfactorily dress, and this combined with an old inherited attitude of what a music performer should be, a notion I've long since discarded, meant that I, ha I felt I had no place in the performance of my own work. At the same time, I had to acknowledge that when I did gather the courage to do so, I had um, these were completely joyful and artistically nourishing experiences. When I decided to start to play my own electronics, often a very simple role, I could therefore mask doing this for the sheer pleasure of it as there were other functions. By allowing the, by allowing the instrumentalist and vocalist to interact free from a click track or other more restrictive mechanism, they could fully invest in the chain of music interactions I value so highly. And because by being involved in this way, however modest the role is, I find that players, both virtual strangers and friends, would talk to me about the rehearsal and performance practice of my piece in a very different way. It had the feeling of having a fake identity card to a private members club. I discovered this after I had my first commission, uh, professional commission for a piece with electronics. So my, my very first experience of this was with, with Sarah Nichols, and all I did was offer to help clear up the cables. Um, and there was a slightly bewildered moment of like, are you, are you sure? Like, there's, there's a wine exception, and probably there's always a wine exception. I'm like, no, there's loads of gear, I don't mind helping clear it up. And that act in itself radically changed the kind of conversation I had for the rest of that tour. They would speak very differently about the, about the performance and about the rehearsal process. Um, this complete and obsessive fascination with the interaction behaviours that make up group musical performances has informed two series of pieces. The first, which I've spoken about before and since published on, 
looks at how chamber music interactions can affect the surface sound of a piece of music. So the agency offered to the performers is not in sharing roles, but in recasting the particular scrutiny or traditional roles. We were talking about, a bit about this earlier on, and I've, I've spoken here about it, but it, it just serves as a little bit of the background. I don't know how legible this will be. There are pieces that are an obsessive, repetitive um, unison with distributed performers around the space. And therefore, you, kind of, you have to see that they're communicating with each other to pull this off. And in these pieces, there's usually always something else going on, video or live electronics entirely independent. Um, and so that foregrounds this kind of interaction. There's a piece written for Nina, um, which asks her speech rhythms to be gradually taken over by two instrumentalists. And so what you have is an entirely new set of rhythms, not one that I could compose, but also not one that has been co-composed for me, one that's emerged because of the way that um, you have to interact in order to perform it in the first place, until it eventually hands all of the material over to the two instrumentalists, and it becomes a sort of combination of their unison coordination, their memory of Nina's original um, speech pattern, and their own speech pattern comes this particular negotiation. And more recently, a piece of music for two saxophones, which takes a very, which takes the complexity with which the two players having to interact as the primary mechanism for how the music moves forward. And so at the start, this is, I would call this syntactically cluttered. The multiphonics are chosen because they don't speak immediately. Pitches have to be passed from one player to another. They're in rhythmic unison. There are a wide array of different bar lengths. You can't do that unless you're really in contact with somebody. And there are similar versions in a time-space notation where each player is re required to cue the other, or in a speech notation, which works like mantra or chant. Um, and again, they really have to stay in touch to do that. Much later in the piece, similar materials, only crotches and minims in 4-4. And when you watch them play it, they are in different worlds, even though it's closely coordinated. Um, the speech goes from this mantra to conversation to argument to soliloquy. When, so even when there are two people playing entirely independently of each other, the surface music is perhaps at its most intricate in terms of the interactions. The feeling on stage is very relaxed, like they're just doing their own thing. It's very clear that that's happening. And I believe that's clear in the audio recording as well. It's coming out on Metier next week. The thing I'll be advertising today. Um, the second strand of work that influenced Crow Rotations is mine and the House of Battles Lockdown album, Enclosure. While I'm in the mood, available in lots of countries. <laughs> um, this is my standard knowledge exchange in the context of my research. <laughs> <laughs> um, while not the first. Um, yeah. It's while not the first piece. Crow Rotations is the most substantial piece I've written since our descent into and our emergence from the COVID lockdowns, where all of us who make music with other people were forced to reflect on the importance of our personal and professional musical interactions. Enclosure is a series of recordings of new and recent pieces and arrangements of mine, and pieces by friends I'd commissioned, which effectively allowed me to take on a chamber performance-like role as a producer, and caused me to scrutinise features of our usual music making. While my composition and music making methodologies are relatively varied, I often simply write a complete score in isolation that is then rehearsed and performed by the group. Here that paradigm is in part inverted, as the music was recorded in isolation and assembled by me in my studio. In attending the performances to sound as natural as possible, both prosaic and more creative features <clears throat> of our group rehearsal and performance process were delegated to me in isolation. I did like click tracks and some reference pictures where necessary, as well as choosing a number of pieces where these weren't required anyway at all. But I asked for very little to be re-recorded. I never asked anyone to play over a recording of anyone else, which is a fairly usual way of keeping people in mind. Um, this means that the pieces dominated by unison lines or unison chords needed hundreds of edits to be precisely realigned, and numerous pictures needed subtle retuning. Furthermore, three of the pieces with that elements of group devising and graphic scores were assembled by me for the materials <clears throat> submitted. So I made all the decisions that would usually be made by the group. In the case of Amber Priestley's piece, Abroad to Beg Your Bacon, um, while she conceded that the music we arrived at could be possible within the group working together, 
the piece is the act of handing over the decision making in the school to the group. As well as being handed over to me, she just couldn't conceive of this as the same piece and renamed it as, as with wholesome hunger plenty. In that case, I reveled not only in taking on the role of assemble, assembling improvised solos and duos, but also found myself making other group performance decisions. In one case, subtly speeding up some of the unison chamber material, I was sure that if we'd all been together, we would have wanted it to be faster. Crow Rotations is a recent song cycle of eight songs lasting approximately 35 minutes, setting a new text by Matthew Welton. It's written for the soprano Julia Fraser and the ensemble that has to bedlam. In this case, flute, doubling alto flute, alto saxophone, cello, and electronic sounds. On the one hand, there is nothing about the piece which is obviously collaborative in terms of the entirely musical relationships, especially when held up against Fraser's definition mentioned earlier. I think there is a stronger claim, if one is needed, for the collaboration of Matthew Wells. Although, again, comparing this with other descriptions of collaboration, this could be considered light touch. However, the piece also represents some of my longest lasting and closest musical relationships. I started the House of Bedlam in 2005, and the saxophonist Carl Raven was an original member. We've been making music together since the second half of my first year as an undergraduate back in 1999, and we have worked on literally dozens of pieces together. I first wrote for Juliet in 2008 in a song for voice and ensemble for them in Symphonietta. Since then, I've written for her several times, including in a full length opera. The cellist Stephanie Tress is a newer member of the ensemble, although through the group and from a commission for her quartet, we've also worked on numerous pieces together. And the flautist Catherine, Catherine Williams is my closest musical ally. We are married, we've made numerous pieces for the two of us, as well as for the group, and we're currently planning a flute concerto, as well as multi-track pieces under the title Music to Help Our Children Sleep. <laughs> Which sort of work. Sometimes. <laughs> I first opened with Matthew Welton as a master's student, and since then I've set eight of his poems. We've written three new works together, including an opera and other substantial theatre work. We've made new performances of existing poems and other texts. While it's hardly unusual to work closely with friends and family over long periods of time, I think it's less usual to consider the musically transformational qualities of these kinds of relationships in the contemporary discourse on composer, performance, and artist collaboration unless individual projects are articulated as collaborative up front. I'll argue that this limits our understanding of the musically transformational qualities of these long-term relationships and creates an artificial silo for where collaborative interaction is situated. Um, we're nearly going to hear some music. Matthew and I first discussed and decided to make a new piece together, and the possibility presented itself through a commission from the prison. We had essentially free reign and had discussed making another new work for Juliet um, together for many years. Although I've set some of Matt's existing texts more recently, this would be our first new work in years. We agreed that in the first instance he would simply send some texts that I would decide how, and we would decide how much conversation was required around them when they emerged. He sent me the first text in early June. And here's a sample of what was sent. This is just under half the first draft. I was excited by this. I don't know how legible that is. Can you see that from the back? Um, I was excited about this. I find Matt's work both intrinsically musical and intrinsically settable. I'm not sure those two things are always the same. I was not disappointed. Despite his generosity, he wanted any more feedback and he would develop any strands I thought were interesting. I was still quite far off being able to start setting the text. I was struck by some of the emergent themes, um, or at least sort of lines of travel within this text. There were crows in the air, crows on the earth, the crows mingling with people, and the movement between all three. So that was the area we decided to focus on, and a month later the text had started to solidify around these things. See that these are not yet anywhere close to the text of the set line. You can't see that, but I can tell you that. Uh, you can see there are still square brackets, there are still bits missing. It's getting relatively late in the day, so there's a sort of pragmatic side to this as well. Um, but at the same time, the text is so suggestive, it sort of was, was thinking to get going for more reasons than simply practical ones. 
I was delighted, so I was delighted with every element of how this is taking shape, except perhaps the pace. Um, I needed some concrete to work on, I needed a mechanism to bring these texts into the circle of the song cycle we were intended. I know Matt very well. Um, his love of lists, formal severity, and variation form. So I suggested a kind of canon X, where the poems would gradually reduce in the number of words, and in contrast, the musical gadget gradually gather in harmonic and sonic variety. To this end, the first text could contain everything to date, and the rest of the poems could be a gradual removal of these materials. The songs could each be in a similar duration, which would highlight the changes in musical and poetic density. I also suggested, given our mutual love of Richard Brodsgum, amongst others, that the second song operate as an evocative list of, in this case, crows. As well as being a framework in which Matt could work his magic, it also meant the text for the final song could be completed there and then, a crow swoops. I was underway, and this is exactly how the final text presents, although most of this, and most of this won't be legible. It's just to give you a sense of the pacing and actually how much this changes. So that's the first song. The second song, third, fourth, the fifth, the seventh. There's loads of useful things about the structure, like I said, it meant we had the song at the end, and we just get going. Um, it meant that there was already a kind of musical framework for us to carry on our discussion. It also meant that um, it meant that it, it would accelerate the process for writing as well, because I know that it was a sort of collection of everything we had and then the process of carving out of that. And that suits parts of the compositional procedure as well, which I'll talk about. Um, in the end, I kind of think of the piece being structured along these lines. I don't know how useful this is, and so I'll talk it through a bit. Um, where effectively all of the songs are, are kind of conceived in pairs with the opening three also being their own little group. And I've changed the colour of the first two. I think the link between, between the first two is the most tenuous. They set up two slightly different materials. They're really connected by the vernacular quality of their setting. The text is extremely clear, and it sort of sits around the, the speech rhythms as, as far as is possible in the context of this kind of work. Um, the, the third and the sixth, we'll, we'll see some of these a bit later on, are connected by the use of sine waves instead of the drones elsewhere, and by the inclusion of this hymn that was sort of composed or half remembered, especially for the occasion. Um, the fourth and the fourth and fifth songs <coughs> are connected by. Sorry, I'll come to this later on. I've got myself really confused. Sleep deprivation. I'll come back to that. The seventh, the seventh and eighth is about the point at which the materials have particularly accumulated. And the eighth song is actually one small part of the seventh spread over about five minutes. Um, so it's those shared materials. The third and the sixth share the hymn. Um, it's not quite right. I was not about to do that's why I said there. It's because it's not quite right. The fourth and the sixth, that's why I'm getting confused, um, share the bits of the song. So they should be in some of the four and six are connected. Five and three, and five and three is by the um, electronics being connected very, very closely to the music, and then cutting out and then out for a different kind of chamber interaction. So that's a really unhealthy diagram. <laughs> the first song therefore contains every word in the piece, but demonstrates the least harmonic variety. The movement of the piece of the whole is conceived as a kind of folk song, but the first three movements being set with the vernacular sensibilities of the text in mind. I'm aware that the text gradually gets more difficult to discern throughout the final five songs, and this is a feature of the sparser text and more elaborate music. Given the audibility for the longer poems and the variation form, I wasn't particularly concerned about this. You, you hear all the words at some point, and I think you get reminded of the as it goes through. The musical accumulation that's most obvious between the movements also begins within the song, as three sections corresponding to the three stanzas of the text add chords and pitches um, for the the whole piece is preoccupied with the performer interactions, and as such, there's a lot of writing in rhythmic unison. The cello outlines the harmonies, and the flute and saxophone are constantly shifting between supporting the cello harmony and the vocal line, further drawing attention to that sort of chamber music discussion. 
The electronics add to and affect the harmonies, although they're designed to be low in the mix, colouring the harmony as a foundational layer, much more contributing. Um, 
So in this case, I really do think of these things as being foundational, as being underneath. They're triggered live, both the start and the stop of each sound, but they're triggered by me off stage. It's not part of the vernacular of that, those interactions that I'm particularly interested in. In fact, in an ideal world, they just won't think about it at all. It'll just happen. I, I was commissioned by a string quartet who I'm super fond of and who are amazing. Um, and I presented them with a piece. And for really good reasons, they just said no. They were concerned, A, that it'd be inappropriate within their set, and B, it would be socially and politically too incendiary um, for them to really to work with. And I was sort of frustrated about this and realized perhaps I'd broken my rule about how I treat electronics. The string content I made for them, which I'm very proud of and, and is meant you know, very sincerely and generously for them, is on click track. And the electronics are equal partners in the entire piece. And I feel like that's one way, I think, of, of finding my way in with a new group. And then we'd gradually shift that relationship over time until perhaps it's entirely invisible. Of course, that's nonsense. I, I'm, I write lots of music with no electronics at all um, for groups that I don't know particularly well. Um, but that, where the option is there, and particularly where I'm involved in that way, that seems to be increasing the way that I might think about it. Um, I'm going to play the second movement. So the second movement is the other. The first two movements establish the materials for this piece, but also it has to do it as minimally as possible because there's supposed to be as few things as possible. So you'll see later on where there's a lot of stuff that's still quite closely connected to what's going on here in one way or another. I, I've drawn, I mean, the saxophone piece I showed you earlier is catawallingly dissonant, and you can hear that this piece is not. And I feel that, I, as I've spoken to you before, I'm quite wary of what we talk about when we talk about compositional voice and identity. Um, and I'm more interested in finding the right materials for the job in any given situation. I like a whole range of sounds, and I'm quite happy for them to permutate my musical identity in lots of different ways. In this case, by wanting ultimately to shuffle the materials of the first and second song together, one of the simplest ways to achieve that was to have one that felt very major and one in a different key that felt very minor. Um, and so that was, although modal, that's effectively how it's achieved.
much it may not be the case. I still, I will, I'm tempted to be not the case, but I still hear the electronics to some extent as something which affects the communication on stage. Or rather, in their absence, it feels like it draws particular attention to them. By removing the electronic sound, it kind of shines a light on those four people and what they're doing. So it's, to me, it makes sense in the first movement, the tempo is slightly relaxed when they sing crows, because those are the only bits that don't have electronic accompaniment. And so that's just a tiny thing to make everybody make contact with each other, to see that, that bit of communication to make it work. Similarly here, the only point at which the harmony is going to radically change to the point where the drones are finished all together, and you get that very different chord towards the end. In the third movement, this is sort of formalized, and it, something similar, I'm not going to play, I'm not going to play on this one or, or the other one at all, something similar happens in the sixth movement with which is paired. You have the materials from the first two songs shuffled together, including the electronic, although now with electronic sounds of the crows, accumulating that material and making something new. And then you have a section of material afterwards where the electronics are cut and the previous material is repeated, but shortened, altered, messed around. The next part of the poem is set with electronics, and then this bit without electronics is subjected to further cuts and compressions and the bit was just sung, it's compressed, and so on and so forth. And so at the start, you have a section of the electronics at a short acoustic moment, and by the end, much longer. <laughs> So, the three elements of the piece, there was, it felt like a kind of world building. There's the, the massive array of drones that are eventually used. There's this folk music universe um, that sets the whole thing in motion. And then finally, I wrote this kind of, this hymn, 
um, which is designed to be something that you feel you'd recognize but you couldn't quite place. Um, it represents, when this moment comes in, it represents a really radical change in the music. It gives Judy a rest for a start. She becomes an accompanying kind of figure. It's just crutches for her at this point. Um, you don't have this, this and its partner movement, which is the only other one that has this hymn, um, is, <clears throat> is characterized by a different electronics. It's not all in rhythmic unison. And in this case, it's a sequence of solos that become duos with the next soloist, and kind of as they have went through. The only time they play in unison is to play this, this hymn material. Okay.
by the final two sons, this sort of accumulation has come to fruition to some extent. The seventh son, as I said, needs to maintain this, this like, um, a connection to this opening folk world. He needs to maintain a certain degree of his minimal aesthetic. And so it's a set of repeated Qur'ans of the ensemble of the voice, each at different tempi, um, each of the same contour, each of the same sensibilities, the same vibe, but no one chord is the same in any point. So every piece of harmonic material is different throughout. Where the electronics are a sort of simple background joint. The longest of them, which is this, I think, where not only is it down to Project 50, it's a search in Project 25, it's halved in its, um, it's doubled in its set of durations, is the final one, which if we have time to be. Um, again, completely new soon. And also, I guess I've seen the other nuanced issue, and if you have that many diatonic chords that are completely decontextualized, they become very difficult to tune. Um, and so that's part of the reason when part of that comes back for the eighth song, it's retuned in eighth tones and sits somewhere around parts of the harmonic series. So it, it hints at, although it doesn't directly access a kind of just intonation, I suppose. Um, but it's five minutes long and I've talked longer than I thought. So we can come back to that if we like. But I'll say something else first. I don't want to go too long. Um, I don't think one thing that I've spoken about today, both in terms of the content of the talk, of the songs themselves, and some of the background and other pieces, have not fed directly and measurably into this piece. The courses in Oberon and Dartington were also taught by Juliet, and we were joined at periodic moments by Theron and Dartington by members of the House of Bedlam as well. And these conversations about pastoral folk music are informed in part by those landscapes. But they're very difficult to pin down. There isn't a moment where we had one big conversation about it. It's a number of times where these things drip feed in. There's conversations about world building, which is as much from conversations with, with Carl about the video games his kids are playing, through to things a little bit more cerebral or a bit more targeted with other pieces of music. Um, I suppose there is something of, of, um, of small sort of notion of musicking as an action, and that action permutating anywhere. He writes that the act of musicking establishes amongst those present a set of relationships, and it's in those relationships that the meaning of the act of musicking lies. So this is in his recasting of music as a noun into a verb. It lies not only in the relationships between the humanly organized sounds, which are conventionally thought of as the stuff of music, but also in the relationships which are established between person and person within the performance space. These sets of relationships stand in turn for relationships in the larger world, outside the performance space, relationships between the person and person, between individuals and society, humanity in the natural world, and even supernatural. And as they are being managed to be by those taking part. And so I sort of feel that this piece is an extension of exactly those sentiments. There's a sense of it being part of this very nebulous range of interactions, that they coalesce and in the concert hall in a way that superficially looks relatively straightforward. It's a piece I wrote, they sing it and play it and they do it well. Um, but actually, all those interactions are really important for how it comes about. I know that my practice has been fundamentally changed by those interactions, both in the long term and the short term. And I don't think it's flattering to imagine a boozy other way. It's in the prosaic, there are not many alto saxophone and flute relationships that sound like that and are embedded in that way. Um, and there are obvious reasons for the longevity of the group that that might be the case. Right through to much bigger changes in the way we have collectively thought about performances and pieces. I contributed to an article by Matthew Sargent and James Saunders um, a, little, a little while ago, um, which was simply, what do composers do all day? Um, and they asked a bunch of composers to answer exactly that question in a short piece of prose. And their point was essentially exactly the same as this, but on the individual basis that the layout of your desk, that the position that you sit in, the things that you think about, and the mundane stuff that you're prepared to talk about as a thought director is as important a part of your contribution to the creative act as anything that you would. And for me, if, if we go back to the Lydia Gurr and say that the work concept began to regulate a practice at a certain point in time, then I want to resist the project concept, if that's allowed to become a thing, of regulating how things are now. 
it very much seems like it's the case that it ghettoizes our activity and that it says that this is the interactions you're allowed to count and this is the interactions you're not. It seems healthy to suggest that we should be accountable, we should be accountable in certain respects. Um, but the idea that that becomes a necessity sits in the place of the project, not in the place of making the work in the first place. So I think that's, I don't know if that's a point yet. It's on its way. Maybe I can have some feedback. <laughs> kind feedback. Um, it's 20 past. Do you want to hear a five minute song or do you want to do one? We've got time. Here have almost all men in our questions. Yes, let's hear it. The final song is the most still in terms of the ensemble, but it has the greatest variety of sound in the electronics. This is the one that, being slightly coordinated to your tones, I think, suggests this otherworldly harmony. And I, I suppose it's part of that taking of a folk music and trying to put it somewhere fantastical, exactly as the small sort of hits it. <laughs>
hand over to you for questions.
you've just gone somewhere where we're sort of starting to think about what are the parameters of collaboration that we capture and that we don't capture, right? That's the sort of essence of music making always, isn't it? And, and it's always been one of the things that's discussed between the live music making and the recorded music making, or the sort of fixations we record. And there was one thing that sort of struck me quite early on in your talk, and you brought us back to it right at the end, that was that you essentially you set out you were in this business of showcasing the collaboration, the communication, right, as as a sort of key feature. And then you were talking about the recording, and you said it took hundreds of takes to realign and to retune the unison chord. Yeah. And I thought, but why are you doing that? And why, you know, so where where are the parameters of collaboration that we're capturing and not capturing? Um, and you know, is why is that process? If we're talking about the ontology of process. What, why is that process of all of us stripped of the diatonic context, pitching that note somewhere different, there's the communication that happens, right? And then you settle. So I was yeah. just sort of interested in how you sort of set your boundaries around what you capture and don't, ca or highlight in terms of the communication. So it's, for me, it's never the visibility of the collaboration, Lauren. Mm -hmm. I've heard I'm, I'm happy to think of that collaboration in a much more nebulous way. It's definitely making the way that chain musicians play chain music more visible. Um, that's what's exciting to me. Mm -hmm. and that's just because I like that. Like that. I find that fascinating. And the other place I find is fascinating for different reasons is in orchestral music. So I've written large scale orchestral music which highlights the hierarchy, it's high, hi, highlights the internal mechanisms. The leader of the section will set a tempo for that section against something else. There'll be those sorts of energies. In terms of the um, the hundreds of edits and things like that, that was, it started off completely instinctively as just a way of making it right. Mm -hmm. This is a written down piece, of, so in a slightly contrary sense, in a slight kind of brr to the whole lockdown, I thought the pieces we're going to make are going to be dominated by unison stuff. Um, but I didn't want to be heavy handed with performers and friends who were not having the best time. <laughs> Um, but I say, no, have you guys have to do that? So just play, just play, just make something super beautiful. I'll do that. Um, and they played and made the, they played the music very beautifully. And everything is slightly misaligned. So I just unmisaligned it. And I misaligned it in such a way that sounded as absolutely natural as possible. So there are things on the record that don't sound natural, but that's to do with the limitations of the recording equipment in people's houses. The limitations are not in the studio. That's where I think it sounds weak. Um, and I just did that because that's what the music required, and I thought it'd be fun. But the observation that, that comes afterwards is this idea that actually the other reason I'm doing this is because I wish I could join in like that. <laughs> I mean, I've got composer friends who were, you know, I've got a your electronics And I'm like, yeah. And what that is is starting and stopping stuff on minutes. And, you know, that's <laughs> lots of composers who don't play uh, instruments to a very high standard, I think, have that kind of nerves of getting involved. And it was an option that I considered delegating the responsibility that I'm trying to solve the footnote. But again, that affects the way they play their changes, so it wasn't really allowed. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, I've got to do it. <laughs> Albeit over the course of several evenings and in isolation, I got to be the one that was part of bringing everyone together, of part of shaping it, part of making the decisions that I wish I could make more instinctively. It's very, very different to sit with a group of people and say, let's try it like this, to me sitting back and say, can you try it? And it felt like I was being privy to the form for the first time ever in a studio context. Yeah, but the Rick button, the reason I did it as well is also because of a kind of finickety nerdy. Like, you know, that, that sort of thing just appeals to my sensibilities anyway. And if I, if I played some of those pieces, it's the full spectrum. There's stuff that's completely free and stuff that is literally a melody played in semi quavers but between two speakers um, in real time. It's just it's very difficult to call it. It's fun to do live mm. because, again, that tension on stage is a big part of it. In the studio, it needs to be perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to that, that time period of you've just received the initial bit of material from that, and then you specifically, and you and Matt as a collective, sort of went through honing, to borrow a phrase from, from earlier, a very deep and broad bit of text into something more more focused. When when compressed over one or two slides, that makes that process seem very easy. Um, but was 
was taking on, I suppose, temporarily the role of literary critic really that easy for you? If, if so, is that maybe as a result of being very well practiced and engaging a lot with this particular writer's work? Or how is how do you how do you feel about that in retrospect? I'm probably not deservedly comfortable with being a literary critic in any context. Um, but I do feel super comfortable with that. And um, he wanted that feedback. And it was driven partly by necessity. But what that kind of raises is something that I wanted to say at the end. Um, um, which is that you know, part of perhaps the ontology of a project concept is the write-up, is the way it's articulated. And therefore, you need to make things that happen within that, within that project that can be written. And if you don't, then that breaks down. You don't have the data that becomes almost as important as the work itself. In a really, really true long collaboration, you have less to say, not more. And so when Matt and I first started out, we talked a lot about these things. And now he says this to me, and, I, and I'm like, well, how about this, what about this? And I'm like, yes, right. Um, because we spent a decade talking about text and music and structure and form and writing and thinking about it. And there will be times, probably whiskey's involved, where we will talk about that at great length again. But there are also times where it's just as fine. And those sort of, the only other sort of very long term relationships I've had have been, you know, with, with Catherine, a long term partner, where ultimately there are plenty of things that we can do around the home where the credibility of the collaboration, if you like, based on what little you have to say, not on how much. And that seems to be very contradictory to the expectations for the project, even if project concept is rather overground. And so, so I think it was great. Like, I was a little bit worried that it was late, so Matt wrote it quick. Like, you know, that, was, that was that. And it took a long time, so we both have really busy lives, and there's no contention with them that result. And if it had been too late, we would have done it. And if, if there were ever going to be arguments about that, we had a lot of time for it. Um, I don't know so, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it seems to. I guess I was just, I was, I was looking at that for a slide as a little exercise to myself before you sort of went on to elaborate on what, what you drew out of that text. I was sort of trying to do a quick analysis myself and I was panicking a little bit in that there was so many, so much to dive into with that in initial bit of text, oh. even with adjectives in parentheses missing. Sure, I, mean, I didn't read it and um, three seconds ago, ah, it must be this. Mm. You're right. Like, I spent time with it and assimilated it and I enjoyed it and considered it. Um, but also, you know, what is composed of not members for making decisions? It's happened for me after a while. <laughs> you know, doing it, I think. Um, on a different day, I think I really let that, the man, and I think that's fine. On a different day, in a project, that wouldn't be okay. In a long-term relationship, that's really not. Um, so it highlights that discrepancy for me again. Um, but no, I mean, I'm not doing it in a bit of time. <laughs> Thank you. I think you had a question. Yeah. Amazing talk about it. It's wonderful, great. And, um, I really love your murderous piece. Um, <laughs> now, I've heard it three times. I heard it on the radio, I heard it in the room. And I now I love it even more because I can see the score. And it's a real tribute to the collaborative skill of the musicians that you. Oh, yeah, they play really well. Oh, my God, it sounds so good. You, you, you write the same accent for such disparate stress. And the Carl Saxo play is so controlled. I, I promised him to be mad. Yeah. Because at the end of your rehearsal, you wanted to kind of go shout at something. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, his maximum dynamic in, in this piece is in the sort of lowest 10% of his dynamic range. And yeah. that takes a very particular. Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, it is. But except that, you know, there's an hard sax for the Um But it's also the restraint is so contextual. I think in, in the film, if you have alto flute and piano and bronchial, they all play piano and it's all piano. If you all play piano here, then Carl would be you know, audible through time and space to make sure you play it. It's yeah. so bad. So, yeah. Why? So this is really um, threatened by such, so forgive me. Why is the, because uh, the third song and the third song have basically the same music, but you have the rhythmic values. What's all that about? The third song and the third song? Yeah, because it's basically the same music, but it's four four <coughs> in the third it's, song with quavers, but with crosses <coughs> in the third song. The third song 
is 50% the first sum and 50% the second sum. And the tempo is the average between the two. Okay. <laughs> I just said <laughs> but the first one, right. the first one is really, it's really hard to pass because the load values are so long, but it went along so quickly. I'm oh yeah, well, so the part of the reason for that was that the, the starting point as, as well, which is not too clean, is that sort of, I really like the way the Renaissance management is written down and how they're paced in that sense. And for me, that gives, uh, I don't know why, it uh, probably makes no sense to anyone else as well, but it's like sort of practicing the pool or something. It gives you a really big span to work and, and for me, that really impacts on the kind of music. For me, that's something that you just sit and start, and three and a half minutes later, you stop. Sound like the most natural thing in the world. It sounds like the amount of change. Yeah. The third one is not. The third one is things cut up and it's much more intricate. And it's, to me, it's like taking two songs and shuffling them together like a pack of cards and having to switch between the two. You can't do that in that case, either actually or in notational terms either. So for me, the notation shifts in order to accommodate the sort of change between the two theories. Um, it's probably not necessary, but that's why. I think it makes a big difference, actually. If I was performing that, So the, the swoops might start with that, but then there's also um, aspects of understated, I hope, word meeting that are associated with those. The most exposed soup of crow is that descent in the string projects. The word crow is characterized by, I suppose, a kind of speaking configuration. That's the basis of the chorale and the song that is repeated um, for all of those lines, and in fact, two more. Because um, I repeated things elsewhere to make Um, technically, a crow swoops is set once, albeit it's spread out for a deal, and that's also the same sort of shape, I suppose. So there's a, there's a literal swoop uh, shape in that respect. Um, but I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to have big melismatic swooping patterns in the world. It would always have to be quite a main thing. Um, sort of um, I mean, it's 
it's a rich word, so they're a, they're a personal swoop, I suppose. It was pretty good time. Um, but it didn't feel like that actually. It felt like um, felt like emergence. You know? It felt restorative um, writing at this point. We're all allowed back out and we get to play that and we get to hear it. And it just felt like a kick. Um, the first the first new piece I wrote, um, which was during my time, was, for, was also songs, also for the book, um, for the Lonesome Theatre, but with a lot. And it was just sort of weird. I would love to be allowed out and to go and do stuff and have drinks with friends. But it was also weird to sit on a chair two metres away from everyone with a mask on the gig. It felt peculiarly disopian. Someone had really made you know, it was rather bad. <laughs> um, so in that sense, I don't yeah, I don't know how to put it. So I don't know how to do this. Shall we have one final question? Brilliant. No. Oh. 
Um, not really. I mean, maybe, like I say, maybe the sort of fantasy space. But I think it's more like um, I find myself on a wobbly tightrope between some modern sensibilities of it's not what you have, it's what you do with it, and some more materially sensitive sort of tendencies, which actually I'd rather just find the thing and present the thing. And I think there's loads of collision between those two somewhat oversimplified sensibilities. So I start by assembling stuff. Huge thank you for a wonderful talk and fantastic music uh, for sharing it with us and for being here. You know, I, I think that's heroic <laughs> at, at the moment, more so than ever. <laughs> thank you very much.